Yes. We met in 1990, didn't we? Oh, yes, I it must have been, yes. It was at Agatha Christie Centenary in Torquay. Oh, yes. Remember that? Yes. Rob and I appeared, I remember it well because we went to England not anticipating that this 100th birthday celebration for Agatha Christie would be black tie. So I can tell you that while gentlemen can rent black tie, if ladies do not have a suitable dress, you're just really out to lunch or you have to go shopping. And I had with me a dress that I wore to go grocery shopping in Santa Fe. <laughs> it was a long, you know, New Mexican dress with a long skirt and all. So I arrived at the banquet in my my New Mexican dress with silver or whatever, hoping everybody would think it was exotic. And sat down with Peter and his yeah. wife, Jags, and I think Harry Keating, if I remember. Oh, probably, yes, yes, yes. It would have been Harry and Sheila Keating, perhaps. It was Sheila. Harry and Sheila, and you too, and I think Robert, um, was it Robert Goddard? I'm going blank. Um, he was published by Glance and wrote some really wonderful books, and he was a chairman, a vice chairman. Richards. Of, thank you. Robert Richards yes. and his wife. Um, and they were all so kind to us because we were completely lost. Mm. Yeah, but it was oh, a good. dazzling time. David Suchet and Jane, Joan Hickson, Joan Hickson. Oh, arrived oh, by train. Oh, they, oh. Ran, they ran a special Orient Express oh, from London to Turkey. It was just, oh, remember yeah. we all went down to the train station and it pulled in. Yeah. And Poirot stepped out and he had this beautiful bouquet of flowers and Joan Hickson emerged from her carriage and David Suchet went over and bowed over her hand. At last we meet, he said. Because in fact they never did, you know, in the Christie's. It was, it was absolutely fabulous. And then we all had a tour of Greenways, which was Agatha Christie's home. But I think now... I didn't get to Greenways. I've never been there. Catherine Garrett was the hostess. Oh, yes. It was great. They had a flower show in the village where, um, to win, you had to do flower arrangements that illustrated the various Agatha Christie titles. Some of which were fairly easy, but my favorite was the Mirror Cracked. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't really that hard. <laughs> it was, I mean, cracked a mirror and then did flowers around it. Yeah. But it was kind of a contest. You went around, you know, like the Stations of the Cross in a Catholic church or something and observed the flower arrangements. And, and you wrote your entries down and then there was a prize for whoever came the closest, you know, to the answer even all correctly. So. You have a very clear memory. Of I, do. I, I do. I can't remember much of this. <laughs> Perhaps I had too much to drink. <laughs> It was super. In any case, I have been an admirer of Peter's work ever since, and at that time, I think we were free, Superintendent yeah. Peter Hyman. Yes, we probably came, yes, he came in about 1991. When did you write The Last Detective? I think, yes, I think I must be writing it then, probably, but it wasn't published until, I think, 19 or 91. Okay. So it's, it's, he's been going for some time, and he was middle-aged when I started. And he still is. So he still is middle age. A bit like Poirot, right. who, who was 130. <laughs> 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 the time the book's finished. Oh, so, true. Yeah. I know. so I knew you from your Birdie series, Birdie, yes. Prince of Wales, of which, what, there were three? There were three, yes. And then um, where I really met him was the Sergeant Cribs, mm -hmm. which were marvelous. And didn't, didn't they ever run on television? Mm -hmm. They did. On the, Yes, they came over here on, on PBS TV, right. which was lovely. They launched that series called Mystery. Right. Uh, oh, did they, were they the actual launch for mystery? They were the launch for mystery, yes. And, and I oh. came over and I was very well looked after at the yeah. Beverly Hills Hotel. And, uh, oh my goodness. And, and met some of the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the important TV people over right. here who were going to introduce them. And, uh, no, it was, it was wonderful. Wonderful. I had a great time. As a young author, it was a, it was a terrific sort of boost to my ego. Right. <laughs> and to my career as well, I think. I love the Sergeant Cribs. I remember yeah. reading them all as they emerged yeah. in the birdies. So naturally, there I was when you wrote The Last Detective. Although you've written some standalones. Um, you haven't yeah. gone back to Crib or Birdie, but as you've written Peter Diamond, you've also interpolated some yes. single novels of various sorts. Yes, that's right. I always, always like to. Uh, I mean, it, 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 once a series is underway, you, you almost feel as though you're on a treadmill. It's nice to break out and do something entirely different. And I've always enjoyed doing these. these we call them one-offs. You probably right. call them standalone. We do, the same thing. Right. Um, but but uh, yeah, and I had some success with them. They, they, yep. they, 
won awards and, and so on. But uh, my favourite is the book called The Reaper, which I wrote uh, probably just four or five years ago. Um, and that's about a, a wicked vicar who kills the bishop in chapter one. Oh. It's a black oh. It's a black <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I say it's my favourite because it comes closest to what I was trying to achieve when I sort of first thought of the idea and right. set out. I, 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 sometimes with a book, you you know you think you're going in a certain direction and uh, you don't quite get there. But for that one, it was yeah, it was what I wanted to do. What about the false inspector do? Yeah, that was mm. that's, I mean that's well known because I <coughs> I won the uh, gold dagger with that in, in England um, and. It's always seemed to have kept in print and people like it. Um, well, a woman on this tour came to me this week, I think it was in Salt Lake City. Okay. She came up to me and she had a big hat, a hat, um, almost touched me, she came so close. And she said, this book, The False Inspector Dune, she says, I've read it. Um, people told me I should read it, so I didn't understand it. <laughs> so I thought, well, when did I write it? Uh, I, and, and I just couldn't begin to explain what it was all about. But uh, she, I said, read it again. It's the best right. thing <laughs> well, there's nonfiction about Inspector Deer, so perhaps, you know, that would have been a good place for yeah. her to start. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. You've also had a very distinguished career writing short, short stories, short fiction. Always enjoyed that, too. Yes, yes. If I could make a living out of it, I would. Uh, just writing short stories simply because of the variety that comes with it. And I've, I've had about five collections published. And if anybody asks me to, to write one, I'll, 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 yes, you I guess I do. So do you have either a short attention span or you're easily yeah, probably Probably that. Probably both. <laughs> probably both, Barbara. Yeah. Yeah. Or is it this that you have all these terrific ideas and lots of them are too small to sustain yes. the whole novel? There are some things that lend themselves to a to a short story right. and some things that don't. Um, with this uh, book, The Tooth Tattoo, that we're going to talk about, that, that I thought for a long time would be a short story. Did you? Yeah. And, and uh, it, it was, it's been germinating for some time. I, mean, I think I first had the idea in 1994. Good Lord. Yeah. Well, it's a very complicated book and they thought we might talk about a few of the elements. The reason I was sort of taking it through your past is that we're doing this webcast that will yes, live yes. forever. Oh, <laughs> so so yes. I thought it wouldn't be a bad idea to sort of review things for yeah. those who yeah. may not yeah. know your work yeah. and see where we um, well, are going. Do you remember the one, and I don't recall the title, about the book club or the book circle? Oh, yes. Blood, I thought that Blood was true. So, no, oh, yeah, no, there was, yes, Blood Hounds was the uh, one. The, the group who met in the crypt yes. yeah, of St. Michael's Church in Bath and right. uh, discussed, yes, discussed uh, mystery and fiction generally. And bad things went and on. bad things went on, yes. 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 Well, I have also enjoyed in the Diamonds your various range. I mean, I remember the one about um, Frankenstein, wasn't it? Mary Bishop yes. who came back yes. to Bath. And yes. So you were able to work in some literary That's history. That's right. It, it, it's always fun to find a little bit of history that's not too well known, some little, little fact. Um, in The Last Detective, the first one in the series, I had something about Jane Austen's aunt, who was a shoplifter. Right. Um, and, and well, I, now, come on, has that completely been proven? That she, oh, yes, yes, really? absolutely, oh yes, she was in, she served time in prison. That's right, um, she did, didn't she? And they had to, yes, they, they had to really pull some strings to get her released. She, she walked into a draper, Draper shop and, and, and um, helped herself to some fabric and lace, and lace, I think it was, and, and uh, it was rolled up, and she managed to sort of get it under her clothes in some way, and walked out of the shop and was arrested soon after. And she was in real trouble. I think that was one of the reasons why Jane Austen wasn't ever to come to her. Aha. Well, that makes perfectly good sense. I wasn't sure she was a kleptomaniac or whether. The aunt, I mean, or the whether aunt, yes. it was, um, you know, more necessity. Uh, no, I don't think it was necessity. I think, I think she, yes, I think, as you say, it could have been, it could have been just a, one of those things that she was about to me. And I did hear someone say once that there was a suggestion that she went back to it later on in life. But I, I, that may not be true. Well, it wasn't a diagnosable condition. No, <laughs> in those days. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so. 
Peter Diamond, he's a really interesting character. He's not always that user friendly. Sometimes he's grumpy, sometimes he's. Yeah, yeah he's a bit, bit of a bully with his staff. And, and, uh, kind of, uh, well, basically, he's a good man, I think. He's got integrity and he, he, uh, he will do the right thing ultimately, but he does it in a rather rough way. Sometimes asked why he's called Diamond, and I, I think probably I, rough diamond. I had that in rough diamond at, at, at the time when he started. There are some elements of me in him, as there are with any writer who, who's got a main character. I think you'll find that there are elements in, in them, and uh, I don't look like Diamond, I hope, but I, I think, I think there are things about me that uh, he loves the old black and white movies, and I do. Um, there are references to the book The Third Man, the film The Third Man in this book. Your book, right. Excuse me just a second while I, you talk, and I'm going to So, uh, yes, so Diamond is a, a, a character who, who, in some ways, likes to go it alone. He, 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 he's a bit of a dinosaur. In the very first book, I described him as a dinosaur. He's lying on a trolley outside the room where an autopsy is taking place. He doesn't like sitting in on autopsies, as policemen are supposed to do, so he has to sleep on the trolley outside, and that's where he's discovered. And with the shape of him, he's got uh, he's quite a big belly. He's lying there, and, and I say I say that he's, when he gets up, it's rather like a, 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 a dinosaur um, rising out of a primeval swamp. <laughs> and, and that was what the the impression I wanted to give, that he, he's a bit old-fashioned in his methods. He, he rather disapproves of the men in white coats, as he calls the uh, <laughs> forensic experts. Right. Yeah. So that's, uh, yes, that, 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 that's uh, Diamond. And he started out a happily married man, but then, yes. then you gave him a particularly oh, ugly yes. challenge. And I get, I get taken to task for that almost every time I give a talk anywhere. Yes. His lovely wife, Steph. Was uh, was marvelous. They, they they had a very good marriage. Um, she was uh, she's probably brighter than Diamond and was able to point to the truth about things um, from time to time and put him in, in the head him in, in the right direction. He was um, very much in love with her and and, and, and uh, so it was going along nicely. And I think it reached about number five or number six in the series. But I, as the writer, felt that it was becoming just a little too cosy and predictable. And I knew how Diamond would behave in almost every situation. And I felt he needed a, a, a some sort of life-changing experience. And so, so the death of his, the murder of his wife in, in, in the book called Diamond Dust, I'm not giving too much away by saying that this happened because it happens in the first chapter. It was a great shock to, to, to many of my readers. Um, I carry around a letter, which I can quickly, if you don't mind, to, to tell you that, that I got, which is typical of many, um, about this very thing. And this is from a lady in, in Monterey who said, Dear Mr. Lovesey, I was so distressed reading your book Diamond Dust. I have been reading all your books, liking in particular the detective Peter Diamond mystery set in Bath. But how could you kill off Steph? I was really horrified. The few pages in each book that focused on Peter and Steph's relationship were always so pleasant and a sort of rounding out of Peter's character, his gruff, cranky moods at work, and the comfortable, loving relationship with his wife. No way to undo this, of course. I'm so curious as to why an author would kill such a pleasant character whom everyone must like. Now what will Peter do? I always went into mourning myself. <laughs> Perhaps there are no more Detective Diamond books coming. I don't care for the books set in the Victorian age, so the Sergeant Crib and Bertie mysteries are not for me. And at this point, she really turns the knife. <laughs> I had a major operation three weeks ago. I've been recuperating at home therefore having lots of time to read. Perhaps my weakened state, an advanced age, 69, <laughs> have made me more susceptible to such losses. 
I can so appreciate a reply from you, no matter how short. I mean, that's a lovely letter, isn't it? <laughs> and I, I, I don't think she would mind me having read it to you, as I've read it to other audiences, because it's so nicely put. And I, I did reply along the lines of uh, the, what I was saying to you just now, that, that, that really it, 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 something had to happen in Diamond's life for me to have a, 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 an incentive to carry on with the series. Um, and, and if ever a, a writer gets a little bit bored, well then you know for sure that the readers will become bored. So, and I haven't now I've been. I, the, the process of him coming to terms with this huge loss in his life um, has been interesting to write about. And then the, uh, the relationship with his friend Paloma, Paloma Keen, um, goes on in the, in, from, from book to book. She'll never replace Steph, I'm sure, and I don't think he'll ever marry Paloma. But uh, she's willing to go stay with Peter on those terms. They, they, they have a physical relationship, they don't live together. And uh, she's also, she's, she's, she has, she has a job um, is, um, researching for television the history of costume. And, and that's, th th there's a big element with all the period dramas that are made, of, of, of that sort of thing going on. So there are ways in which she can help Diamond when, when, when it touches on, on her particular knowledge. <laughs> That's interesting because Bath has a great costume museum, which you might imagine. It does, yes. The Regency, and any of you have watched the Bletchley Circle, if you watched any of the stuff that came afterward when they discussed in great detail about how they dressed the actors, you know, to, to be authentic. I thought the Bletchley Circle was great until the last half hour, and I thought the whole thing just completely fell apart. I was uh, so mm -hmm. disappointed, but I really liked it up until then. But costume was a big part of it. However, yes. Um, it's a good thing we brought along Paloma, because Diamond was not a success at the dating game. I mean, that was <laughs> really not <laughs> his forte, no. Um, but uh, Paloma's important in the tooth tattoo because it opens when she and Peter have gone to Vienna on um, a romantic weekend, which is not going to be his thing anyway. And he is <laughs> obsessed with the third man, with the you know Orson Welles movie and all, and which was was it all filmed in Vienna or was it the finale? I don't remember because I haven't seen well, it for so well, long. Would you like me to read a little from it because you could. I, I have been reading it sure. along the way and, and uh, there's a copy it conveniently would, Since you you give me one introduction <laughs> for it, so entirely by uh, chance, but yeah, 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 yeah. So I I, I could do that. Um, just, a, just two or three pages. Uh, Vienna, 2012. So instead of being in Bath, he, he turns up in this European city. How much longer does it last? Paloma Keen asked Peter Diamond. Aren't you enjoying it? I'm trying not to breathe. Diamond felt in his pocket and produced a tube of peppermints. The man who thinks of everything. Thanks, but an oxygen mask would be better. There are days when the Vienna sewer tour is more odorous than others. Wise tourists take note of the humidity before booking. Diamond and Paloma on their weekend city break had no choice. Saturday afternoon or nothing. It happened that this Saturday in July was warm, with a thunderstorm threatening. Even Diamond had noticed that the smell was not Chanel number no. 5. After this, you'll appreciate the Ferris wheel. She was silent. She brought this on herself when reminding him that his favorite film, The Third Man, was set in Vienna. At the time, she congratulated herself for thinking on it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been here. The adventure had begun back in April with a scratch card she had found on the floor of his car. Diamond hadn't bothered to check it. He'd said they were giving them away at the petrol station. She'd revealed three matching symbols told him he was a winner. Everyone is. She had insisted on phoning the number on the back of the car. Deeply skeptical, Diamond had told her that's how they make their money. But it had turned out that he really had won a weekend break for two in a city of his choice. Paris, Amsterdam or Vienna. True to form, he dismissed Europe's historic capitals with a dogmatic, I don't do abroad. <laughs> Come on, Paloma had said. Lighten up, Peter. This could be so romantic. I'm too busy at work. 
work for Diamond was heading the CID section at Bath Police Station. There were always matters to be investigated. Then Paloma had remembered the third man, and whistled the Harry Lyme theme. What did you say those cities were, he'd said, looking up. <laughs> and here they were, trudging through a reeking sewer with a bunch of elderly tourists carrying flashlights. At intervals, everyone stopped to be shown a clip of the film, projected onto the brick wall opposite. Paloma could see Diamond's lips move silently in sync with the soundtrack. <laughs> it's the main sewer. Runs into the blue Danube. So obviously was he relishing the experience that it would have been churlish to complain. They had started agreeably enough in the Café Mozart, another of the film locations. The coffee and sacker tort were expensive, even for a couple used to bath prices. But Diamond had basked in the ambience and said the experience was worth every euro and talked about Graham Greene being a regular there in 1947 when he was researching the story. From there, they'd moved on to a side street off the Nash Market, and he'd stressed how fortunate they were to be here on a Saturday. The only day of the week, the Third Man Museum opened. Displayed along with countless stills and posters was the actual zither Anton Karas had used <laughs> to play the haunting theme. You could select from 400 cover versions of the tune. <laughs> Paloma had left the place with a headache that Diamond said was surely something to do with the weather. A short walk had brought them to Esperanto Park and the brick-built spiral staircase down to the oldest part of Vienna's sewer system. Proceedings underground had begun with a film explaining how the cholera epidemic of 1830 had made a better sanitation system necessary. Then, after warnings to watch their footing, the guide had led them into the glistening, brick-lined drains. Atmospheric? Paloma couldn't argue with that. She just wished every film clip wasn't punctuated with another head-numbing burst of the zipper music. Are you enjoying this? she asked Diamond, in the faint hope that he'd had enough. Brilliant. There was no opting out. This was not the best place to get lost if she tried returning to the stairs. How's your head now? Diamond asked. About the same. I think I should warn you that at the end of the tour, a man dressed as Harry Lyon steps out and fires a gun at us. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there we are. Yes. So it, 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 in Vienna. Uh, there's a reason why, why, why he's there, but I better not give too much away. No. No, but let's so let's talk about. I was going to talk to you about the third man and his obsession with it, but let's talk about tooth tattoos. A revelation to me. Oh yes, yes. I, I'm not sure where I first heard about them. I, I can remember most things with these books, but I I can't remember where this where this came from. But I discovered that um, although it sounds horrible, the idea of of, of a tooth and being tattooed very painful. My, my son Phil said he doesn't want to read the book because uh, he has some trouble with the dentist. <laughs> but um, no, it's actually it's um, you you adhere little things, you stick little things with with some super glue or something similar to to a tooth, and it's it's an uh, you know it's an attraction I suppose like any other um, tattoo or, uh, or, or whatever, and it's particularly popular in Japan. Um, Barbara is wearing Japanese. I am mm -hmm. from Kyoto. I actually yeah, am yes, wearing in honor my, of the in honor of the book. Right, my theme dressing <laughs> yes, routine, yes, but yes, I did yes. buy it in Kyoto. Um, you know, it's not really that different than um, people put diamonds in their teeth or the gold bling. You know, it's yes, sort of a gang yes. culture mm -hmm. thing, or mm -hmm. or maybe it's mafia. I don't know what. But That's anyway, right. but it goes. The, sorry, we don't say. But the helpful thing for a detective is that all the, if a body is um, underwater and deteriorates terribly teeth don't. Right. Uh, and um, this is the, the vital clue in, in, in this particular story, that uh, you, the body is found in, in the canal and has a tooth tattoo. So clearly there's, there's, there's going to be a connection in some way with Japan. There is. Not going to say any more than that. <laughs> but the next thing, Will, are you back there? Yep. Um, we're going to play just a Oh. A, a little bit of the, the Beethoven piece because um, 
much of this mystery centers around a um, musical, a stringed instrument group called the Staccati, which I think is a wonderful name for it. Now, my husband and I belong to the Phoenix Chamber Music Society, and we love it. So we've gone to lots of lots of chamber yes. music and also in Santa Fe, but it was really fun to read about the Staccati, who have lost a crucial member of the group. Um, but not the person with the, with the tooth tattoo, just to make that clear. So they're looking for a, um, a new member and auditioning a new member of the group, and it's crucial to the plot. So, you know, in this day and age, you can go out on the internet and just conveniently download a small amount of music, which we yeah. probably shouldn't do since we're an outfit here that in theory supports royalties, but so. This was Ill this was legally obtained. It was legally <laughs> obtained. Legally obtained. <laughs> All right. So no piracy here for yes. Beethoven. Yes. Well, that's wonderful. I, I didn't expect S music like that. Well, so I'm hoping that we'll hear just a little bit. And so my next question was going to be, why did you fasten upon this particular piece? Oh. Well, um, back in 1994, as I mentioned, I had the idea for the story. Sorry. I will let you go first. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. You're going to let it play? Sure. Play, play it for a moment or two. I'm starting to say that, that, in, that the, the idea occurred to me in 1994. I'm often asked where ideas come from. And I know precisely where this one came from because it, it was a, an article that I, I read in the newspaper. And I still have it, and I thought it was going to be a short story, but it turned out to be a, a novel eventually. An article about a string quartet. It was in the Guardian newspaper in England, uh, and it's called Fours a Crowd. But the little piece at the top was what intrigued me most. How do the members of a string quartet play together and tour together year in, year out, without killing each other? <laughs> so, so there it was. Now, this, you know, it's some of the most sort of divine ethereal music known to man, and yet you have to think about the musicians who are playing it, and they may be at daggers drawn with each other, and sometimes are. Um, and when I I, I, I mean, this man gives one or two examples of, of um, string quartets who the members didn't like to sort of, to sit together on planes or, or they, it went to a hotel, they'd ask for rooms on different floors. <laughs> at, at breakfast they would eat at separate tables, although they, you know, that, that kind of thing. And I, I thought, yeah, it's okay. Um, and then I heard about the Audubon Quartet, a famous American quartet, um, who had a, a terrible experience in, in that they were they were very very big very 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 um, well regarded they played for Jimmy Carter at the White House <laughs> um, they had a residency at Virginia Tech for, for more than 20 years so, and so they were well established but as happens with groups of 
four people, if three gang up on one of them, then you really do have a problem. It turned out that the, the first violinist was the unpopular one, and the other three decided when it came round to the year 2000 that it was time that they got a new first violin and dropped this guy with David Ehrlich. Um, and he then was going to lose his earnings. I mean, they were, they were, they were earning good money. So he went to his lawyers. And in the process, and these things go on for a long time once the lawyers get involved, it, it, it was six years before the thing came properly to court. And he won the case. Um, and he was awarded $611,000 bankrupted the other three. And I believe they even had to sell their instruments. So there, there's a story. Now, if that isn't a motive for murder, what would be that? I didn't use that story as a plot line, but it, and it does show that, that, that um, this interesting thing, that, 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 the, that the musicians themselves, you know, might not get on together. And I wanted to develop the, the four characters I'm talking about, the new one, Mel, you mentioned, Barbara. The one who was auditioning, right? Yes, and, and the others who were already established in, in the group. Uh, and I, when I sort of began to think of it as a short story, I could see that it was going to be much more than a short story, sure. if I was going to do justice to the, to the characters. So I, did, I, I worked on it and it became a novel. It germinated for many years and uh, finally put it together and it, it has become this story. Um, and I wanted a little to to show the, the the energy and the excitement that goes into making music. Um, I thought your description of him auditioning for the other three members, this very difficult piece that we just listened to, was amazing. And the other thing that um, a lot of people don't even think about is the contract law involved in professional musical group, you know, four players and um, their obligations, which are often booked years in advance. Yes. Um, they have a residency thing where they get income, but, you know, um, chamber music concerts are often like just about other musical contracts. It's this very difficult area of law that most of the time today specialists represent um, musicians or actors or whatever it may be. but. It's a lot harder to get a divorce from a music group than to just get a divorce. But we should mention in the book that they're not they're not divorcing somebody. There's somebody missing, yes. and so they're looking for a you know a new um, violinist. And and the guy Mel I found really interesting because he's he's kind of what you might call kind of a journeyman musician. He hasn't been although displays talent as we move along here. He hasn't been like a, a huge solo success. It's not like they're looking for, you know, Isaac Stern here or it's Zach Perlman or something, you know. And he's he's surprised when he's invited to audition for the Staccati and he's not very optimistic about how it's gonna go. Yeah. But they have a residency in Bath at the university, which is one reason why all this is going on. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is Netsuki. Do you have a passion, I mean, a passion for Netsuki? No, I, I don't really. It, it, it came into the story, and I, I, um, I, 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 I was aware of them. Uh, right. I know a little, a little about them. And with anything that I do, I try to uh, find out as much as I can. Um, but uh, no, I wouldn't say I'm at all an expert on Netsuki. Well, why did you even think of Netsuki? I mean, I thought well, it was it, fascinating. It was necessary to the plot. Oh. Ah. <laughs> 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 we're well, not giving away anymore. <laughs> but you know, Netsuki can range all the way from like something you might buy at Woolworths to oh, mm. incredibly expensive. You know, yes, and yes. They, they can be very antique and they can be remarkably expensive and very collectible, um, depending on your level. So. Uh, they're really, remember when I was mentioning earlier to our um, legal group over here, they had suddenly paintings that become a way of laundering money or um, art collections. Did you all read the paper about the Brazilian financier who embezzled like $40 million from his bank and invested it all in his art collection? So now they have this horrible problem, which is, you know, they've caught him and now are they going to like divest him of the art collection and liquidate it? 
in order to repay this. And the Isabella Stewart Gardner theft, you know, where they finally think they figured out what happened, um, they believe was the paintings were stolen as collateral for some criminal enterprise. So Mitsuki, if you're Japanese, and are, or you don't even have to be Japanese, they're in a Suki collectors and other, I think the Metropolitan in New York is, if I remember right, a pretty decent Mitsuki collection. Um, so, you know, they can be beautiful, valuable of themselves, but also have a monetary value on Mitsuki because they're tiny or really portable. Do you own any Barbara? I have one, um, mm -hmm. but mine is, is a very low end one, of, mm -hmm. you know, something mm -hmm. that I bought. Um, there's a beautiful temple outside Kyoto called the Moss Temple. Oh which is the entire garden is moss. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very ancient thing, and the water, I mean, it's beyond damp. <laughs> I was thinking about your sewer. <laughs> Let me tell you, the moss garden, although it smells nice. But um, you have to book into it way ahead of time. So Lori King uh, yes. and Rob and I are touring Japan together because she wants to write a Mary Russell book about Japan. And she booked us into the moss garden. In order to go there, you not only have to get tickets in advance and be proper, um, at the, at the gate, because they won't let you in. They give you about a three minute tolerance. But then you have to go in and the um, monks who run the garden and the temple present you with ink and a scroll and you have to kneel down for half an hour and you have to copy calligraphy, beautiful Japanese calligraphy um, in the scroll as a way of getting your mind and your spirit ready to visit the garden, there's this, it's like a decompression thing, you know, that you go through, plus your knees also <laughs> can really hurt while you're doing all this, but, and um, the light isn't always good, so, you know, you see lots of aging Americans with bad knees or bad eyesight, <laughs> <laughs> sneaking around trying to find, you know, just the right place to go, but anyway, after you do this, you then walk out, and the entire thing is just astonishing, it's moss everywhere, um, and you kind of thread your way through it, but they had a lovely gift shop, and I oh, bought, an, I bought a little, a <laughs> little yes, well Mitsuki yeah. from, from the Moss Garden as kind of a souvenir, which I have. I have an Apsara from uh, Angkor Wat, oh, so I like to, you know, bring home some, yeah. only in my case I'm not laundering money, it's mm. American <laughs> Express is the <laughs> <laughs> beneficiary of all of this. But I thought it was an interesting, you know, I mean, your books are always unusual, but I thought this one, you know, we have the third man. We have the string quartet, we have the Beethoven, we have the tooth tattoo, and we have the Natsuki. Now, would that occur to you <laughs> as kind of the ingredients for a novel, you know, at first blush, no? No. It, it, it kind of came together. So I can see why you had to let it gel for a long time <laughs> to work it out. Um, yes. I thought this was one of your more complex um, negotiations here, but I really liked it. Well, it's had some very good reviews, so I'm pleased to people do seem to enjoy it. Great. Mm -hmm. Any of you have questions that you'd like to ask Mr. Brooks as a lifetime fan of Mr. Lovesy? Mm -hmm. Any questions you'd like to ask? <laughs> Actually, this, as Barbara was, was saying, this seems very heavily researched. Is that why it took so long to come out? Was there a lot of research that went into uh, no, it? No, I wouldn't say I was researching all that time. Right. Uh, thinking think, thinking a, little, a little about uh, concept of the string quartet but the, no, the, the, the research and I, I, don't, I don't really like the research to show too obviously I think if it, once it does if somebody says oh you must have done a lot of research you know, then then you've lost them you, you want that you want whatever it is that goes into the story to be part of the plot moving it along um, so although you read a great deal um, you you only use, I suppose, about one twentieth of what you what you read and, uh, and discover. Um, but it's such a joy to find some little thing that you know is going to be just right for the story. Very exciting, I find that, and, and always had. Um, so it's uh, I, I, I read obviously I read uh, books that I all the books that I could find. I went to the um, the Strand Bookshop in New York about this time last year and came away with four or five second-hand um, books, um, autobiographies by musicians who played in string quartets, a book about a string quartet, and, and, and so on. Um, I read as many articles as I could, and there's plenty on the internet, 
even even there, even if you go look for, looking for articles about warring musicians in, in string quartets, you can find there there are pieces about that as well. And I listen to the music, as Barbara said, you, it's so only too easy on YouTube to to, to find a, a famous group playing one of these things. So that too was a, was part of the inspiration that, that went into it. And I wanted. Towards the end of the book, I'm not going to give give much away here, but a, a, towards the end of the book, instead of having a, a chase scene, as you often do, you know, when things get exciting and your and your villain is about to be exposed and and, and brought to, to, to justice, I wanted it. I wanted the music to play a part in the excitement. So the explanation takes place against the background of uh, the playing of one of these string quartets. Um, and and uh, that was a challenge for me, and one that I very much enjoyed doing, and I, I, I hope I pulled it off. One or two people said they weren't quite sure whether it, whether it was appropriate to do it that way, but others have said, no, it, it, this was really original and different and exciting. Besides, it's your book. Yes. <laughs> um, I should mention something. I think it's really important to understanding all this um, as, a, as a person who has spent all lifetime attending chamber music concerts and so forth. What's different about a chamber group as compared to an orchestra is an orchestra has a conductor, and the conductor is in control, and the conductor, the orchestra is usually playing the conductor's interpretation of the music. The conductor determines the tempo, um, you know, cues the instruments, all the rest of it. Chamber music has no conductor, and so it's basically a negotiation. If you go to a rehearsal, what you find is that the musicians are taking apart the piece bit by bit, and they all have to achieve some kind of consensus about how they're going to play it. It may be that the first violinist, but not always the first violinist, will cue them to start or something, because, I mean, you know, somebody has to go. But it really is a consensual performance as compared to an orchestral performance. And I find the rehearsals often are far more interesting than the concert. When I go to Santa Fe uh, in the summer, they've had a chamber music festival all this time, and I go to some of the performances, but mostly I like to go to the rehearsals. It's really fascinating, you know, to watch them um, agree. And there's a huge amount of friction that, you know, if you've got artists, four artists, you know, who are all soloists in a way, but nevertheless have to blend as an ensemble, and they all have opinions about how this music should be played, and there's no real arbiter of it, plus four is an even number. So three is better. Trios, you know, you're, you're always going to wind up with two and one, and but for four it's more, more difficult. And I find that whole process yes, fascinating. Yes, so having yes, done that, when I read your book, I thought, you know, that you might have been a person like me who goes to a lot of chamber music mm -hmm. rehearsals. Yeah, well, I, 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 I mean, isn't that how it works? No, I haven't been privileged to, to go to rehearsals. No, no. I, I've, I've only heard performances, really. Uh, and, and, rehearsals yeah, yeah. are really the fascinating yes, yes. part of oh, it. Oh, it must be, yes, yes. I mean, I've read about it and read about what goes on, and uh, a lot of that goes into the story. But, uh, mm -hmm. You've cued another short reading, Barbara, really. <laughs> If you don't mind, right. yeah, I know we, I know we right. say questions, but uh, you, this is um, this is Mel and and, and the beginning of uh, what what happens with um, with the court. His introduction, Acton, West London, 2012. Temptation arrives in many forms. For Mel, it was cued by the opening notes of Beethoven's Fifth, the ringtone on his phone. Da 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 da. <laughs> da 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 da. -da. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Farron, the viola player, a male voice, educated, middle-aged, and as imperious as Sir Thomas Beecham's in rehearsal. That's me. Do you have a moment? Depends. Are you selling something? Certainly not. This is a serious call. A rap <laughs> over the knuckles. Mel should have cut the call immediately and saved himself from the wrecking ball that was swinging his way. Who are you? He asked. That's immaterial at this juncture. Call me Ivan if you wish. I have a proposal massively to your advantage. You are trying to sell something. Mm -hmm. Pay attention, please. This is about your professional career. As a musician? Naturally. A gig? A pause. Ivan was plainly unhappy with the expression. 
and considering whether to hang up. More than that, much more if you're prepared to cooperate. But this is too important to discuss over the phone. Are you free tomorrow evening? Free for what? For a drink and a chance to discuss the opportunity? I'll send a car at 7.30. You know where I live? This isn't spur of the moment, Mr. Fallon. I've heard you play or I wouldn't be bothering. Let's admit it. Flattery is a surefire persuader. Where are we having this drink? At my club. There's a dress code, by the way. Lounge suit and tie. You do possess a suit? Irritated by the patronizing tone, skeptical yet intrigued, Mel switched off and pocketed the phone. In truth, he was in no position to turn down the invitation. A life in classical music is precarious. His income from orchestral work and teaching was barely a living wage. Yet he was good at what he did. He'd been gifted with perfect pitch, and a mother hooked on Mozart. Handed a miniature violin at an age when other kids were learning to tie their shoelaces, he'd mastered the basics within days. He was taught by an elderly Polish maestro, and within a year, on his advice, switched to a miniature viola. Really, they do exist. Mm -hmm. But violists, the maestro told him, were always in demand, whereas there was a glut of violinists. The old man had been right to a degree. Mel had never gone for long without ensemble work. He'd survived. However, there wasn't much prospect of advancement. Solo opportunities with the viola were rare. If he'd excelled at the violin, as everyone suggested he could have done, the repertoire is huge, and he could have toughed it out with the army of East Asian players who came along at that time. No use complaining now. He could play both instruments to a good level, but it was the viola he was known for. He trained at the Royal College and filled in with some of the great orchestras of Europe. Violists are an endangered species. If he'd known just how endangered, wouldn't have listened to Ivan. But he was an innocent. At 29, he needed an opportunity, and this promised to be it. Single, hetero, not bad looking, he was originally from Beaconsfield, and currently living in a pokey first floor flat in Acton, West London. Finger Street had never seen the like of the gleaming black limo that drew up outside at 7.30. Good thing he didn't keep it waiting or the local youths would have unscrewed the Mercedes logo in seconds and <laughs> scraped a coin along the bodywork to see if it was real. He was wearing an almost new pinstripe suit from Oxfam. You can bet the original owner had died, but you can't get fussed about stuff like that when you're skint and need to look respectable. All of his work clothes, evening suits, dress shirts and bow ties, black and white, also came from charity shops bargains everyone. Where exactly are we going? He asked the driver. Clubland, sir, St. James's. Which club? I was told it's confidential. Well, I'm being driven there, so I'm going to find out. <laughs> and I had my orders, sir. Mel didn't press him. If Ivan wanted to make a cloak and dagger occasion out of the meeting, let it be, he told himself, to calm his nerves. He hoped this wouldn't turn out to be a huge letdown. For all the man-about-town bluster, Mel couldn't say he was familiar with the St. James's area of London. He'd never set foot in a gentleman's club, and when they drew up outside a set of white steps to a shiny black door with brass fittings, he forgot to look for the name. The doorman had his instructions and waved Mel through when he said who he was. Carpeted entrance hall, grand staircase, and oil paintings in gold frames. Mel couldn't say who painted them, except it wasn't Andy Warhol or Francis Bacon. A short, bald man appeared from behind a potted fern and extended his hand. The grip was firm, as if they were old chums. So glad you came. There's an anteroom we can have to ourselves. Have you eaten? Yes, Mel lied, not wanting to be treated to a meal before he knew what this was about. In that case, cognac should go down well, agreed. A beer would have been more to Mel's liking, but he didn't have the neck to ask for one club servant was sent for the cognac. Bound copies of Punch lined the engine. Laughs all round. I still don't know your surname, Mel said, when they were seated in leather armchairs either side of a marble fireplace big enough to park a car in. 
Better you don't and listen until we come to an agreement, his host said. You will have guessed I too am a musician. Violin, you've heard me play. Have I? Possibly in the concert hall and certainly on disc. What do you say to that? If the guy was a soloist, Mel didn't recognize him. He could think of dozens he heard in the last eight years. In a well-known string quartet, he added. Ah, am I supposed to guess which? No. Be mysterious, Mel thought. See if I care. The cognac arrived in a cut-glass decanter and was poured into balloon glasses. Ivan waited for the flunky to leave the room. There could be a vacancy in the quartet, Ivan said. Could be? Is. For a violist, and you had me in mind? In mind is a good way of putting it. Mel waited, but nothing else followed. Is this an offer? Not yet. The others will have a say. Are they coming here to join us? No. Who are they? That's not for me to say. All this stone walking was hard to take. Ivan had issued the invitation. He should have been selling the deal. Instead, he was swirling the brandy in the glass as if he was reading tea leaves. At last, he said, it's not straightforward. That's getting obvious, Mel said. The others don't know I've approached you. I believe I can persuade them. We play as a unit, but we're all individuals, which is our strength. A quartet of yes men would never make fine music. Playing in a quartet is all about dialogue, distinct voices that respond to each other, but not passively. There's question and answer in musical terms, sharp debate, argument even. It isn't all resolution and harmony. Mel felt like saying he wasn't a total beginner. He played in quartets. You said they don't know about me. What if they don't approve? I would expect to persuade them, if I'm persuaded myself. You said on the phone you heard me play. But can you commit? Commit what? Murder? A cheap remark. Something had to be said to lighten the mood. Ivan didn't smile. Commit to a trial period of say a year. It would mean total loyalty to the quartet. Rehearsals, business meetings, performances, recordings, and touring. I'd need to know more. In particular, who am I replacing? That I can't say. Has he retired or have you given him the elbow? Neither. Died? Silence. He's still playing? You're plotting to dump him and he doesn't know? A shake of the head. We're professionals, Mr. Fallon. We have our disagreements, but we're not like that. Speaking of the professional part, how much would I expect to earn? I need to live. Enough for that and more. We divide all the income equally, and that includes our manager. As a new member, you take home precisely the same as the rest of us. Not as much as a bank executive earns, but better than you're used to getting. How much approximately? Just under six figures in a good year. Yikes. This was the first thing Mel had heard that he liked. <laughs> Stop there, but it, it sort of just gives you that intro that um, Barbara was mentioning, where, where Mel begins to get involved in the uh, in this strange, strange quartet called the Staccati. And you know, it's interesting because you've been reading for this and some of your other works. You have like these big action entrances, the one about the Civil War. Oh, yes. Reenactment. Yes. I mean, we're in a battle scene out on a hill and, you know, yes. bolts are flying and things are going on. So. This, this book has a different, you know, a different tone. Yeah, a quiet sort of Yeah, um, because you, yes. you've written so many action-driven Peter Diamonds as well. Mm. But lots of different emotional levels, whether yes. it's grief or whether it's, you know, I think that makes it intriguing when yes. you're reading the whole body of it. Yes. Sam, they also have a question they'd like to ask? Are you, are you working on the next one? I've written the next one. Really? Yeah. Yes, that's cheering, yes. isn't it? Yes, that's delivered, and uh, they're reading it at the moment. So uh, I, I hope, in fact, they bought it, uh, it uh, ahead, of, ahead of reading it, which is really, really uh, gratifying. That's nice. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's Diamond again? It's Diamond again, yes, oh, yes. Good. I, I'm not going to say much about mm -hmm. it, um, except that it's called The Stone Lady, and will it appear about a year from now? Excellent. Is more? Sorry, I, I've given you the wrong title. It's The Stone Wife. Oh, yes, okay. yes. Um, the Hen, lady detective from Hen Malin, yes, yeah. uh, who appears in some of the uh, earlier books. Not in this one, no. But but I have plans for her. Uh, she's not uh, 
not completely out in the cold. It's good character. Yes, good, thank you. Thank you. I, I, several people have asked about her, so I, I'm encouraged to, uh, to write about her again. Anybody else? I'm interested in your creative process while this mm. novel was germinating. You have the article there and got a germ of an idea for the book there. Yes. I guess. Do you take notes and put them on the shelf and then come back to it over the years? How did you work through that? I, I think it, it stayed in my head. Um, and only when I was ready to go and, and thought it, it would nicely fit into the, 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 um, the bath setting if I had a residency in Bath where, where they, they, they come and they can stay for some time and, and then the investigation process can go on at the same time as, as these people are performing. Um, that, once I got that, then it seemed to me that it, was, it could become a, a diamond novel rather than just being a, a, a short story which might not have been about him at all. It could have been said anywhere. Um, but the process really gets underway um, when I give myself the sort of go ahead and say I'm, I'm going to write this book then I, I, I read intensively and write slowly um, I'm doing some research as I'm going along but I, I'm a very slow writer um, it can't be that slow for him and say well I have a book out every book year. Year. yeah but if you write two to about two to three hundred words every day you, you get a book Oh, I see. Um, Slow but steady. Yeah. You're and I don't, the tortoise. I don't work in drafts. Uh, I think I've told you this before. Right. But, um, I, 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 I'm a Virgo, a perfectionist, and I can't leave a sentence or a paragraph until I've got it right. So what I've written is basically what will go to the to the printer. Um, so you're not a revisionist. No revising. There's no revising person. going along at all. But but that does entail thinking it through and having a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. Have you ever written you yourself through. into a corner you had to back out of? I, not, not really, because I, I, I think those things through. I think, how, where are the corners and how, how, right. will, I, how will I avoid them? Um, well, did you, sorry, did yeah, you have sorry. to do that with waxwork? Oh, did you have to write one, that twice? That was one book. Yes, I didn't really write myself into a corner, but I just thought as I was well into it, I'm writing this from the wrong point of view. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'd written it as a, a first-person book from the point of view of the um, female character in, in the book, and then I began to see that it, it wasn't it wasn't the best way to do it. Although I could probably have finished the book and had the plot and had the storyline all worked out, it would be better if it was written from a more neutral point of view and. The, and the, the writer, the, 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 yes, from the author's point of view, so it was written in the third person, so I had some rewriting to do. Yeah, but, but that's, I think that's the only example where I've, where I've um, had a rethink, a major rethink. Well, I've worked crib in there now with Waxwork. The six unpublished stories, do you think they'll ever get published as oh, a short well, story some collection? Or there were stories that, that appeared on TV, on Granada, yeah. TV scripts. No, I don't yeah, think so. No. I, 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 um, um, Douglas Green uh, from Crippen and Landrew mm -hmm. um, has expressed interest in just publishing the scripts, but but uh, we haven't sort of quite got round to, to, to that yet. Uh, um, but I wouldn't want to novelise them as, well, as right, it were. Right. Uh, I, I don't think they. Well, what happened was that the I was very fortunate when a TV series came along in that they adapted the eight books that I had written for television. Um, and then asked for six more. Um, but the the, uh, the eight books were used up very quickly because the, the each episode was about 51 minutes, uh, allowing time for commercials in an hour. And um, so the, the, the plots were simplified quite a bit. But the, the ones that were written just for television were more straightforward plots. Uh, I did them with Jax, my wife. And um, I, th I think some of them work better than the, book, the adaptations of the books, simply because they were we knew similar. what yeah we knew what we were doing. We we, we knew that we had to have a, a you know a, a good exciting moment before each commercial break. <laughs> so <laughs> people would to come back after they'd made their cup of tea or whatever. Uh, and and uh, yes, I was uh, I, quite pleased with them, but I, I, I'm not sure. I don't I don't I don't know how they would um, how they would go 
was uh, history. other scripts. We've been watching um, Red Chill very lately, uh, belatedly, the uh, D.L. and Fast oh, yes. series. Oh, yes, yes. And does. Reg's books, as you know, are very complicated, and they're too complicated for the space available. So mm -hmm. the last two that we've watched, Rob has said to me, <laughs> yes. What happened? I mean, yeah. What was that? What was that? And there really isn't time. You know, and Ian Rankin, when he was here, said that he did not like the Rebus TV adaptations no, no. because no. the books uh, were too long for just the hour. Yeah, He's hoping yeah, to yeah. get them back and, and redo them. Mm. And I think you're right, you know, that, um, and of course, Colin Dexter, when he did Morse, yes. he ran out of books fairly yes. soon. Yes. And yes. so there's tons of Morse that were just written, you know, for television. We used to have people come in and try to buy them, you know, and I'd have to say, <laughs> no, you know, they don't exist um, in but, book form. And the other interesting thing is that television is such a powerful medium right. that you, you see the images of, Characters and, and the actors' faces somehow replace the images they that do. you had in your I own brain. I just discussed that with Peter Robinson, trying to oh, get yes. used to the guy mm. that's playing Alan Banks, and you know he's well, you know he's sort of grown on me, but he's not like Banks. That's that's where you yeah. are, yeah. but yeah. Um, it does become true. Well, it meant for me that I just didn't write any more of them after the TV series appeared. Right. I, I, I just felt the creative bit had gone wanted to move on to other things. Something more contemporary. Mm. Well, I do think it's fortunate that Bath has such a rich cultural life because you've written about the theater, you've written about Civil War reenactors, you've written literary stuff, you've had some just thugs, um, <laughs> you know, yes. uh, now we have music, but I mean, you've really sort of run a whole spectrum of yeah. interesting, you know, and I think for a small city that Bath is extremely rich yes. ground for you to mine. And not used up yet, I know. No, no, not at all. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's, I mean, there's the whole bit with the Abbey and Roman yes. rooms and all. I mean, there's so much to do, even mm. though it's small. It's also um, a place that's in a river valley. I mean, I've been there several times, and oftentimes the traffic and the weather can do you in. Oh, yes. You yes, know, the yes, fog. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to live in Bath myself. No. It, it does become very impressive in the summer, and yes, but the, the surrounding hills pretty heavy on the sun, on a hot summer day. And buggy. Right. There's a girl from Chicago. <laughs> say that buggy yeah. is that. Great. Well, Peter, this has been fabulous to talk to you. Thank you for coming to see us again. Thank you very much. Now, for those of you who, um, do we have Patrick King? Yes, ma'am. Do we have a few numbers we can use? Uh, one, two, five. Okay. Um, would you pick oh. a number? I'm going to give away a book to somebody, number oh, one through five. Oh, right. Um, six. You can't do six. There's oh, five. Here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, there you are. Pay yes, yes. yes. I'm sorry. I'm okay, we'll, we'll go for four. We'll go All for four. right. Who is number four? It's you. Then I'm giving you a copy of a British mystery set in Oxford where terrible things are happening and nobody knows what's going on. Oh, well. um, and I really enjoyed it. You have to read it all the way to the end, I thought, um, to do that. Thank you all so much for coming down this evening um, to welcome Peter back, and thank you for coming to see us. So a round of applause. You can yes. sit there and chat with people, yes, and I'm, you guys can get your book signed. I'm, and thank I'm, you very much for coming. I'm very happy to chat whether you're buying the book or not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, don't feel bored. Or get a photo or get a photo. Oh, sorry. 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 Oh, sorry.